is Beth Marsh, and I am the Director of Membership, Marketing, and Communications for the Organization of American Historians. Our webinar this evening is part of a professional development series made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The Organization of American Historians is located on the campus of Indiana University Bloomington. We wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, Potawatomi and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Our webinar this evening will be led by Lori Kukler. Lori Shea Kukler is a local author and historian specializing in narrative histories and articles relating to the history of Portland and the Pacific Northwest. Her first publication was the Portland Police Sunshine Division, an early history, and she is currently working on a biography of Portland's first woman mayor, Dorothy McCullough Lee. Lori has a Master of Arts from Merrill Hurst University and specializes in oral history. She completed a thesis entitled The Mercy of the Soil, the Relevance of Phenomenological Hermeneutics to Oral History. Lori is the principal partner for Kukler Nonprofit Consulting. She actively contracts with several organizations and clients. She is the author of over $20 million in successful foundation and governmental grants for educational, historical, cultural, and economic development and human agencies and human service agencies. She occasionally evaluates grant applications for the NEH and the state of Oregon, and is currently an adjunct liberal arts instructor at Southern New Hampshire University. Born in Seattle, Washington, and raised throughout the Pacific Northwest, she now resides halfway at Mount Hood on a small plot of land with her husband, Wayne Kuchler, two dogs, two cats, and six chickens. And with that, I would like to welcome Lori. Um, thank you for joining us and for facilitating this session this evening. Thank you, it's great to be here. I'd like to acknowledge as well that my land on um, Mount Hood in Oregon uh, used to be uh, in my region. So I'd like to share my screen if I could. Uh, are you able to see uh, the grant historians or grant writer screen yet? No, it, it doesn't look like it's up. Okay, all right. Let's make sure we got it there. All right, how are we doing? You got it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this webinar is something that I have been talking about for quite some time. I am uh, someone who has written a quite a few grants for a quite a few organizations. And what occurred to me was that as I have developed in this career, people would say, what, how do you train to be a grant writer? And there, there really isn't a training per se. Um, there are programs for it, but Degree-wise, I would say that my degree in history and my master's degree in interdisciplinary studies that worked with the discipline of history and psychology were the two were the three degrees that prepared me for grant writing more than anything else. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to offer to you some ideas about how what you already know. Um, could be woven together for you to be an effective grant writer, or if you're already a grant writer and you're already doing grants within a historical organization or within a university or a nonprofit, there could be people in your midst that would be excellent grant writers because they already have within them their own uh, characteristics, personality, training, skill sets that would make for an excellent grant writer. It was, a, it was a, a university president that I worked for, but I was working in a different department who said to me, you're a grant writer. And I, I didn't believe her at first, 
And over time, I began to realize she was absolutely right. Uh, we've already talked about my qualifications, so we'll go ahead and move on. The reason that grant writing is something that engages the historian very, very well is because grant writing is very much about the past. It's about the past of an organization that uh, is hoping to change programs or change the future. And the only way that someone is going to be willing to give them funding will be if they have a secure enough sustainability structure for funding to work for them. So I, I think about rivers a lot when it comes to grant writing and the present streams to us from the past. Upon its current, we navigate future. In other words, the past of an organization and, and the present as it emerges through time is, is the story that a grantor needs to hear about that will give them enough confidence to offer you funding for a program that you propose. I came to this realization, particularly while I was teaching Introduction to History course for non-majors at a small liberal arts college in Portland. I had the opportunity to join the students in further immersing myself in Roy Rosenzweig's and David Fellin's text, The Presence of the Past, Popular Uses of History in American Life. At the same time, I was also writing grants for a social service agency called Morrison Child and Family Services. As I taught this course time and again for the freshmen as they came through, I began to integrate the author's historiography into my approach to grant writing, or better yet, into my ways of thinking about gaining support from other people for a better future. In imagining, this is Thelen's afterthoughts, both Rosenzweig and Thelen had an afterthought chapter that were as good as the whole book. In imagining how participatory historical culture could help people reach from the personal to the collective, I suggest three tentative observations about how we might use the past, then illustrate them with possible applications to classrooms, in his case, for me, grant writing. First, we can find where people are and how they wanna be heard by listening hard to the voices and styles they select as they use the past. Second, we can imagine how to improve our present circumstances by turning to the past for alternatives. And finally, we can use the past to develop institutions and programs that better reflect our needs. And that's where this webinar comes in. We use the past to develop institutions and programs that better reflect our needs. Whether or not we recognize it, history lives under and within the present, engaging itself in everything we do. And the business of writing grants and asking people for funding is very much a historical act. Good historians are good grant writers because grant applications are full of contextual questions about past and present circumstances. Granters wanna know how your organization got where it is today and where it thinks it's going. Grant questions are carefully designed and required attachments are specifically chosen to determine if the history and the trajectory or the future of your organization has the capacity to sustain the project you are proposing to them. And successful grant writers are able to communicate the history and the context upon which a proposed project can be successful. Historians are good grant writers. We understand how the past informs them. This is a lot like a historiography class. It's also one that points toward uh, a future, a very specific time. This picture has always had a, a dramatic impact on me. Muhammad Mohideen Anis, 70, smokes his pipe as he sits in his destroyed bedroom listening to music on his vinyl player in Aleppo's formerly rebel-held Alshar neighborhood. When, when the photographer Joseph I saw the photograph player had survived the blasts, Mohammed Anis said to him, I will play it for you, but first you have to light, I have to light my pipe because I never listen to music without it. Mohammed 
was engaging the past into his present reality and thinking about perhaps i wouldn't venture to know what he's thinking but perhaps thinking about how the past has brought a certain element of place and hopefully future the two primer, primary informers of a grant narrative therefore is the past and that's why historians are particularly good at writing grants because most everything of what you write about in a grant is about the past up into the present. And even when they're asking for a current budget, that budget was written three weeks ago, which is the past. And posing what you hope to do with the future if your funder offers the support that you're asking for. So it's, it's not really about the present. And that's why a lot of people get stuck. I don't know what to say historians quickly can figure out what to say if they realize that they're writing about the past. So this is gonna be a two-part grant webinar. Part one, in the first portion of the webinar, I'll propose how a, can, how a historian can approach grant writing in ways that will help them interpret most application formats. I say that because really when you dig in and you look at most questions contextually, they all have a very specific purpose that's universal. I hope to encourage you to begin to accept the transferability of your existing historical skill set into the process of grant writing and to introduce you to the assumption that although the methods by which grantors format their questions will change, basic premise and purpose in most grants are universal and consistent. The second part of the webinar uh, will help you begin to realize, contextualize your own organization's past within existing realities and help you think about what kind of historic, current, relevant, accurate information is the premise upon which a successful proposal can be crafted. And, and I'm hoping to briefly familiarize you with the characteristics of a typical grant application or request for, for proposals and help you interpret them within the context of how we tend to see the world and help evaluate and assess whether a grant source is a probable fit for your institution or for your project. This is an example. This image is an example of RFPs, requests for proposals. And so this is a Oregon Community Foundation and they uh, are offering funding for very specific kinds of programs and one would apply for one that seems relevant to what they want to do with the future of their organization. So let's take a minute and consider what you already know, or perhaps what I think you know, assuming that most of us are in watching this webinar are historians of one kind or another. And what we're going to be doing really is, in, in some ways, this is going to feel very familiar with to you. It'll feel like something you already know. Because really what we're doing is we're weaving together existing knowledge that most people in our craft possess. And we're putting it together in such a way that could benefit your organization or perhaps your career path. Um, <clears throat> if you're applying for an internship, a fellowship, applying for a job, uh, it is always a good thing if someone appears to be someone who can put together proposals for their department or their organization. When writing anything, most historians have learned that it's important to consider these questions. So let's think of weaving what you already know. Most historians always think about, who am I talking? You already understand the concept of adjusting a narrative for a defined audience whether it's nine, ninth graders or your thesis committee, you are putting together a narrative for a defined audience. And in this case, a funder. How should I make my argument? That's something that a lot of historians consider. You already understand the ideas behind the rhetorical arguments presented through most liberal arts education programs required by degrees in history. 
including the persuasive integration of ethos, pathos, logos, kairos. I apologize for that, but I promise you, uh, we're going to revisit them in a in a painless way. What is and you're wondering what is the context for the proposal? You already understand because of who you are and what you do that to better communicate your your proposal, you must help your audience or perhaps funder contextualize and integrate your past and future as they consider your current aspirations. And here's a great example of things you didn't know you know. You may be familiar with the scholarly variations of these terms pulled from, directly from, a grant select glossary for grant writers. The, by the way, the links on some of these resources are down at the bottom of uh, the screen here. So if you do come back to this after it's posted on the OAH website, you can get, and also uh, Beth is posting these links in the chat. But these are familiar terms, uh, amended proposal. And let's say you do a thesis proposal and they take it back and want you to amend it. This is, this is a, a road we've been down. Uh, boilerplate is is marketing term for phrases that are constantly used. Uh, you know what a deadline is. Uh, an organizational history is pretty self-descriptive. Organizational history, underserved population, guidelines, types of arguments. These are things that are present in the vernacular of the grant writing world. And there is a, if, if this were a Venn diagram, they would overlap dramatically with uh, the historical writer. So let's take, let's synthesize and directly apply historical skills to the typical questions and universal features of quest or proposal or P or grant. There's many names for what it is, but basically it's an institution that says, we have money, we want to give money to certain kinds of things. Are you doing those kinds of things? Uh, that's an RFP. So the first thing to consider is you define and you contextualize your audience. Conversation's sake, we're coming to a comparable prospect. So for a minute, we're assuming we have found a funder who is who is funding something that our organization wants to do. So thinking about audience, the audience of a grant application is the readers of the grant. And those readers are either first tier readers or they are actual evaluators, like when I evaluated for the uh, NEH, where we read uh, grant applications and we try to find ones that fit the program that we are hoping to award grants toward. So you contextualize your audience. So think for a moment, the audience are people for grants uh, embedded in the profession of history. The, the readers are very, very much like me. They're uh, in the group. Our funders uh, from the humanities or historical professions. They have a strong idea of, of what you're trying to accomplish already. And in fact, they assume that you, you need to assume that the funder wants to read a complete, well-written proposal and wants to award the grant to a relevant, sustainable program. Think of it the same way as if you're taking in assignments from students. And I'll confess, uh, when I'm reading essays, I put my the students I know are going to do a killer essay. I put them last because it's for me to run for the essays. There, it's it's exciting, it's rewarding to read a really good uh, written work that follows the objectives for the uh, assignment. Same thing with a grant reader. They get excited about a proposal that hits all the marks, that checks all the boxes, and someone has done it succinctly and well. Your, college, your proposal readers are often college-educated people tasked to read dozens and dozens of applications well into the night. So write what you want to read. So as you define and contextualize your audience, you think honestly that these folks really are peers. And they are hoping 
that you will be successful. When you change your attitude toward the audience, you will find that grant writing is not as much a dreaded activity as many people claim that it is. Because really what you're trying to do is communicate to people who are hoping that your proposal is successful. So moving forward, common formal argument considerations for grant narratives with that audience in mind is that four-legged table. Now, some universities leave out kairos, but in grant writing, kairos is extremely important. Ethos, pathos, logos, kairos, who remain quite useful when trying to persuade someone to give money. So you're not really a salesperson, but in a way you are persuading someone that you believe that what you're trying to accomplish is consistent with what they want to give money. So let's go quickly. How you come across to the fund in this circumstance would be right, therefore, and I'm giving specific instructions now because most of the folks in this room, virtual room, uh, know how to do this. You write in a knowledgeable, informed voice that respects the reader as an intelligent, non-expert, but an insider. So in other words, if you're writing an archival grant to the IMLS, you have readers who are archival experts, and some might be historians. And so you write to an intelligent, non-expert insider. So there's a lot of digital um, technical language in archival grants. So you would want to make sure that in that sort of a situation, you're writing to the intelligent non-expert. Some grants require writing at the level of a peer-reviewed journal, therefore, but most are best written at the level of an undergraduate history textbook. So I'm giving specific instructions now. It depends upon the expertise of the funder and you get a sense for that. If it's a community foundation like the uh, image that we had a little while ago, those folks are, are insiders in that they hope the best and they care about their local history, but they might not be a digital uh, archival expert. So you would need to get a sense for your reader and your ethos would be knowing that reader and coming across in such a way that you aren't speaking over their head or oversimplifying. If you're required to use technical jargon, you provide definitions where possible. So sometimes you have to have technical jargon because you have to give descriptions of equipment that you want to buy. Often a glossary as an addendum is something that I often do. And I've had grantors uh, tell me how grateful they are that I offer that because I don't clutter up the grant with definitions, but it's there for the people who don't know what I'm talking about. And you use current, inclusive, gender neutral terminology and language. Grants is best practice in grant is gender neutral writing. So work on your gender neutral writing skills. Write as if uh, gender um, is not a part of the conversation. And uh, there's a lot of uh, resources out there for you to help you develop your gender neutral terminology, even when you're speaking of individuals who will be completing the task. So pathos, this is a very important element of grant writing. And it in fact is probably one of the reasons people do not want to write grants is they have the misconception that they're supposed to be selling something, that they're supposed to be um, moralizing people to give money when nothing could be farther from the truth. The pathos of a good grant narrative is uncontrived communicative balance. And what I mean by that is, as with writing history, a reader's emotional response should only be a byproduct of carefully articulated and relevant evidence rather than manipulation through adjectives and impassioned interpretations. I will go through a grant application and look for adjectives in the find. I'll open the Word document and I'll say find and I'll say very. And I'll go through my grant and make sure I've removed all of the varies because there's nothing quantifiable about the word very. And, you know, very good, very happy, you know, those kinds of words are not necessary. 
because as you know, through your own work as a historian, that the story can speak for itself. If a story is tragic, if a story is compelling, if you've given the information that your reader needs, they can complete the human response to that without you having to prompt them. The need statement or thesis uh, would be almost synonymous in the grant world for the project must be supported by mission, data, purpose, and predicted outcomes, not through moralization. You know, if you don't do this, these children will not learn to read. That sort of thing is an excellent way to have your grant ignored. You do not want to moralize people. The thing to do would be to say, for example, when I worked for Morrison Child and Family Services, uh, we had a grant that we wanted to put together at home learning uh, packages and parental engagement support packages for foster children because foster children often arrive at kindergarten without even knowing their alphabet or their colors. And so I don't need to go on about the sadness of that. I just simply offer uh, the funder, the statistics shows the learning levels of uh, kindergartners who are have been in foster care for four years. I don't need to describe how someone should feel about that. So descriptive, complete, factual evidence provide a respectful voice, allowing the reader's own emotions to be a product of compelling circumstances. Because you've given them enough information, logos, that's coming up, to understand the humanity of the situation for themselves, they will not feel manipulated or played. These, by the way, are my dogs and they want a goodie and they can't have a goodie no matter how they look at me like that. By the way, do not act like that with a grunter. Logos, your appeal to reason. And this is where a historian can really shine. You offer an appeal to reason through both requested and unrequested data and contextual information. Using claims of existence, causality, the need for action, you respond to the grantor's question and instructions with specific quantitative information. Substantial data-based information essential to understanding of your request as a measurable proposed outcome. So you walk them through how here are the circumstances. If these things are in place, the circumstances will be different and they will be like this. Now it's uncomfortable for uh, us to predict the future. We've been trained not to, but it is okay for us to be, to say the obvious. Um, for example, when I was working at the Oregon Historical Society, I put together a grant program where individuals could donate to a bus transportation uh, fund where schools could call the museum and ask for funding to pay for a bus to take children to the museum. Um, it was very predictable for me to say that based upon how many requests we had to turn down last year, uh, that we could improve the number of buses that come to the museum by the amount that was the difference between the ones that we could funding to and we had to turn. So there's, there's ways of predicting the future that are comfortable historian. And this is important and it's often out of most English programs, um, but this one is important in this situation. You make the right request at the right time in the right way to the right people for the right reasons. And what makes people uncomfortable writing a grant is when they intuitively know that one of those things is missing and they feel uh, manipulative or they feel like perhaps wasting their time when they're being asked to write a grant to a funder. Uh, that grant writer starts digging, uh, they start realizing this isn't a good fit. So timing is everything and you would need to tactfully figure out how to explain to the powers that be that this isn't a good fit and here's why. 
Your grant is a financial request for your organization for the greater good and to give the grantor an opportunity to support something that's important to them as well. So the request is at the right time in the right way to the right people. So knowing what a foundation or a government entity is hoping to fund and not um, ignoring their specific details saying what they are going to prefer is really important. Many funders will tip their hand for you and say, here's the grant, um, the request for proposals, here's, here's what we will allow, what we think we will consider, but here's what we really want. And honestly, you must take the what we really want into consideration as much as all of the other requirements because uh, that will be the inner circle of grants being considered would be what they really want. Describing a detailed big picture is what historians do. Through the collection of details, historians often have the ability to see a complex situation in totality, particularly circumstances involving a dizzying array of data, events, time, specific periods, and complex relationships. Because of that, we're often, we often possess an aptitude for determining which grant opportunities could be a likely fit for an organization. So use your gift for contextualization to help your organization decide who likely funders will be. Allow yourself to be that skeptic, to be that person in the room that says, oh, I don't know about that one, they really are hoping to. You have an aptitude for analyzing, assessing, and prioritizing information given to us by our project or program managers, organizational staff, administration. In other words, you're good at historical research. And even for explaining to the funder what might appear to be irregularities in our documents and budgets by offering the funder supplemental information and insight. What I mean by that is, let's say that you're in an organization and they did a bunch of capital improvements the year before, and it made it appear as if their budget was uh, not functioning um, in, uh, in the black. What you can do is you can do a narrative that explains, well, we had to re-roof the entire facility, and that costs, you know, $400,000. So, you are someone who can take a look at the whole situation and help a funder understand that the capital improvements are not necessarily an indication of whether or not your programs are gonna be continued. In fact, they were necessary for your program to continue. So here's a case in point for all of that ethos, pathos, logos, chiros stuff I was talking about. This is downtown Portland, beautiful downtown Portland and the Oregon Journal building Portland, Oregon. I was first hired to, as the grant manager at the Oregon Historical Society. My research began when I took the position, I created a spreadsheet of the entire history of the organization. I went to the keeper, I went to the accountants, I went to the development director, I went to the executive director, and I went to program managers and I created as best I could and a, a history of grant grants that the organization received, and it's over a hundred year old organization. I created then a spreadsheet of all the potential humanities grantors at the national, statewide, and local levels and recorded what they grant and when. So I made a, a parallel um, record of everyone who gave to anyone does what OHS does in our area and a, about, a, about a 40 year history of that. Then I interviewed, oh, this, is very his, this is a very history geek thing to be doing, don't you think? And then I interviewed OHS administrators and created a spreadsheet of all upcoming OHS museum projects, exhibits, archival projects from digitization to ephemera and artifacts for the next five years. So I went, I qualified my conversations with these folks and said, this isn't what you're going to get funding for, but I need to know 
what your plans are. What are you doing? What is happening? What are the exhibits? What is what's in what still needs to be accessioned? What are we doing for five years? So after all that, this is one of the examples of what we came up with. The Jackson fam family owned a local newspaper, the Oregon Journal from 1902 to 1982, and still managed a large family-based granting foundation with an active philanthropic statewide identity. After analyzing my grant research and talking to the current archive director, I learned that the Jackson family donated all of the Oregon Journal's photographic negatives and glass slides to the Oregon Historical Society to archive in, and they did that in the early 2000s. And they had, they were still yet to be digitized. They were inventoried loosely, but they had yet to be digitized because of lack of funding. There had been a few small unrelated grants to Oregon Historical Society from the Jackson Foundation in the past, a few grants here and there, typically for general fund. You got it, must grant love. I had the museum, uh, the archival director meet with the Jackson Foundation uh, representatives, and it was easy for all of them to quickly come to the conclusion that the Jackson Foundation should be directing its fund to the archive to process the very photographs and negatives and glass slides that their family had donated when their paper uh, uh, ceased to exist. We conducted historical research on both funding partners and wrote a grant application based on those findings. This partnership helped both our organizations use the past and the present to find a good solution for a future project that fulfilled both organizational missions. It, it's difficult to explain how giddy everyone was about this, including the funder, because when they find that thing that really is important to them, it's quite rewarding and the relationship continues. They continue to fund uh, the OHS uh, project there. And as many of you know, uh, uh, digitization is an ongoing uh, funding challenge. And so whether it's doing the actual digitization or whether it's keeping files up to date. So here's an example of one of their uh, pictures. Uh, this was a glass slide. Delivering papers. Although grant success can require creativity and speculation about what the future could hold, it mostly comes down to explanations, facts, data, and not sales tactics. Not only does the proposal process require that you think objectively, but you must identify a quantifiable need and how based on the facts, the solution will be delivered and measured. Keep in a certain amount of historical objectivity amid your own biased perspective, except that you are trained to do both of these things well. You know how to do this. You've had to do this for historical writings for a long time. So let's get into the questions then um, and, and directly apply this tapestry of knowledge that you have to the questions it, that are in typical requests for proposals. Grantors must first know how know if your organization has the structures in place for your projects to succeed. Nearly all detailed grant questions look at your organization past and present. They, Determine how your organization's history and purpose lead to your proposal. Does it make sense? Help grantors determine if your organization has the expertise, persons in place, capacity to undertake the project. So the digitization grant needed, I need to be able to explain the credentials of the people who would do the work. <clears throat> and help funders determine if you and your proposal fits their known funding objectives. The command of your organization's historic and current day information will help you prioritize what, when, and where to offer your answers. Your use of detailed information will be the difference between a well-written proposal and an incomplete one. Grant writing is not selling, it is telling. It's a, it's, 
it's a convincing, well-informed, well-cited argument using every tool of credibility and information that space allows. I would add that it is also showing. You are showing them with the data that you provide. So part two, interpreting a sample RFP, request for proposal. We're gonna use an example from the Collins Foundation uh, to discuss the basic and typical meanings and purpose behind common grant application questions and requirements and, and interpret them within the context of how we see the world, to consider where to research information or locate assistance within your institution, university, or administration to support your narrative and application. You know, it's great to be a researcher, but uh, in this situation, you might not know where to go to get the information. So the Collins Foundation um, is a foundation in Oregon that uh, supports all kinds of things. Uh, and it's, it's one of the major funders in our state. And we're gonna take a look at their application. But before we go there, um, something for you to know, it's like, you're thinking, okay, great, Lori, who, where do I find these funders? Uh, that would be an entirely different webinar, but I can tell you what I do. I use the what's called the Foundation Directory online, and it is uh, the link is here, and the link is also uh, going to be present in the chat, and it's available to you when you review this webinar because it's so riveting. You're going to want to see it again. Uh, but what this is, is this is the screen in this search engine. And I, as a, as a freelance grant writer, I pay $50 a month for this. It's available to, it's usually available at most universities um, and procurement offices sometimes are a little bit protective of it because they don't want people to go grant writing without checking with university authority on the matter, which is, a, again, a whole nother webinar. But if you're trying to find grants um, and you're working for a nonprofit organization or you've been given permission by your university to, to seek out funding, um, this is uh, a good place to go. And you just basically, I, I've self-taught myself how to search, but this is an example of what you can learn. And there's, you can, surf around on this and find even more information about a particular funder. And there's Boolean searches on what they do and why. So, but they're the Collins Foundation application. Uh, it, this is the narrative for it. And it, <clears throat> these are the kinds of questions that a, a typical major funder applicant application asks. And also in government grants, these are typically the kinds of questions that you'll be required to respond to in the narrative. You'll be required to offer a brief overview of your organization, including your mission history program areas and the community you serve, description of how you address issues of equity and disparities of access, opportunities or outcomes internally within your organization and in your community. These are, this is verbatim from the Collins website. This is a description of the project that you want to do, including the amount of the request, starting date and timeline, need for the project, and on the questions go. We're going to break them down one at a time. And I'm going to talk to you about where you find this stuff. Because, okay, Lori, we'll research, but where do I go? So a brief overview of your organization, including your mission history program areas and the community you serve. You would go to your organization's web page and you would go to your marketing department. You go to any uh, public sources where someone has created, remember the word boilerplate, the words and the languages used for branding and marketing for your organization are the exact words for your grants. It's not plagiarism, it's uh, marketing and branding and boilerplate usage. You do uh, need to double check with um, the, people, the producers of these narratives to make sure that their uh, public facing documents are up to date. But for example, here, 
this Washington State University is a public land grant research university with its flagship and campus in Washington founded in eight. This is from the uh, about us link on the Washington State University webpage. Those narratives are great starting places for you to plug into these kinds of questions where you know that you're being consistent with your organization, you're not inventing the wheel, and what you're producing is, is already been approved by the powers that be. The next thing they ask is a description of how you address issues of equity and, and disparities of access, opportunities, or outcomes internally within your organization, your community. In this case, uh, what we're looking for is you would go to your human resources department and you would ask them what uh, they are doing and what their programs are and where they stand in them. Are they in process? Are they rewriting the uh, university policies? Are they, uh, what is happening with that at this time? And you would, you would research with them how to respond to this question. And oftentimes you'll give the HR representatives a copy of what you're saying to make sure that it's consistent with what's occurring in the organization. So they, if you recall, this is a bunch of bullet points in the second half of the app. They wanna know the amount of the request. That's pretty simple. You just write how much you're asking. You might need to include a budget later showing other things, but that's a very simple answer. The description of the project, including a starting date and timeline. Oftentimes, if you do a work plan that's similar to what you would see in an NEH or an IMLS grant, uh, a work plan would be uh, a, a longitudinal um, look at, and we'll use Excel spread for a work plan. If narrative, I'll use bullet points. But this, this is something that is, is answered by the person who's actually going to implement the program. If you're doing it, then it would be you. But for example, the digitization project for the Jackson Foundation archive director uh, did this timeline. And I put it into the grant and had that person review it to make sure I recorded it accurately. A description of the project, including the need for the project, how it's socially, culturally, or economically relevant to the community you serve. Uh, for example, with the school bus grants that we discussed a little while ago at the Oregon Historical Society, that one uh, was fairly uh, uh, easy to explain. Um, I did use some uh, pathos qualitative narrative in that from school children who enjoyed the museum. We just had put in some age uh, appropriate uh, exhibits in throughout the museum and they were gobbling them up. And I went down and, and asked students what they thought about it. And I used some of those quotes in the grant uh, when asking for transportation funds. So that gave a, a word picture to people uh, directly quoting from someone how they felt about how it was fun to come to the museum to play. Oh, wow, that you've really, you've really struck the nail on the head when a, when a child goes to a museum and feels like they're playing. Description of the project, including goals and proposed activities to meet the goals. This is one that could be a whole new webinar as well, but goals, objectives, and activities are, it's wise for you to become familiar with what those terms mean and how they come together when explaining what you plan to do with a proposal. But the goals would be very much the outcomes uh, that you're hoping to measure and provide to people. Description of the project, including the number and demographics of the people you expect to serve. So for example, when I was conducting the research for the grant for transportation, I didn't, we don't take demographics of our museum visitors. It wasn't, uh, wasn't appropriate to do that. So 
what I could do was I, I went to visitor services and I got all the data from all of the different schools that came to the, uh, and took advantage of the scholarship program, went to the school district websites and got the demographics of those schools uh, for the grade levels of the visitors. And I was able to give that demographic information. So that's a great example of the kind of historic research that makes a tremendous amount of sense in the world that I live in. How you engage the community, you serve in the development of your strategy and goals. So um, this is one where, uh, uh, an example of a major exhibit put together at HS was we completely redid our History of Oregon exhibition, which is the primary um, magnet exhibit for the organization. And it was antiquated and, and uh, not indicative of a complete history of the state of Oregon. So the way for us to uh, be inclusive and with the retelling of Oregon history involved three years of community meetings. And so that, that was the first grant to write uh, for that project was uh, funding to put together the community meetings for the creation of that exhibit. That would be the answer to that question. That would be an example of that. And what's most important, uh, they're taught the last piece is how successful measured. So that's what I was speaking of earlier, where there's a quantitative number. There is when we read, we're eventually going to have to do a grant report. And in that grant report, you're going to want to be able to say, we said we were going to provide, you know, 30 bucks of uh, funding to the or we we proposed that this new program at fill in the blank university would have you know uh, 200 graduates at the end of 10 years and it's wonderful to be able to report back to a funder that you have made that accomplishment so you have to decide you have to get your crystal ball look into the future and decide how you're going to measure success and then tell them how you're going to do it and then when the reports start uh, happening, you, you tell them. And a description of the project, including plans to sustain it beyond the grant period. This is from the uh, um, digitization project we talked about early with the Oregon Journal. This is a boat ran aground, run aground. Uh, you have to be able to sustain what you're doing. In other words, for example, with the digitization project, they have to know that we have the uh, technical capacity for uh, thousands upon thousands of images. It has to be sustainable. That This stuff has to have somewhere to be. It has to be disseminated to the public. Do you have funding to support that? And where is it coming from? That's sustainability. And as a grant writer, you don't have to come up with that stuff. You just need to go to the directors of these programs and say, ask the same question and, and have them provide the answer. So granting organizations and the humans who read hundreds of narratives on their behalf yearn for a well-written proposal that makes sense. They, we long for the moment when an effective writer mediates a relevant and plausible cause that's a good fit for the grant program. Not unlike a thesis proposal, a grant proposal engages claims of existence and defends a collective need for action. You locate and cite official data-driven information essential toward a complete argument for the request. And you use that data to defend how the project will fulfill the outcomes of a grant award agreement. And the outcome can be extremely rewarding. I put this up here because uh, last year, 
wrote a grant. That building you see right there on the left uh, left is uh, one of the smallest grants I've written. But it's one of the most rewarding because Trillium Lake up on Mount Hood, this is about 20 miles from Lake is beautiful. And people from the metropolitan area pour into it and it's very congested. And there was a outfitting company that wanted to be able to house their rentals on site so there wasn't so much traffic and people would just pull in with normal vehicles and park and be able to rent. Anyway, make a long story short, this is the building under construction and there's some very happy uh, uh, outfitters. And the, I worked with the Forest Service, uh, the local um, tour organ and uh, this outfitting group to create a, a place where there weren't large trucks delivering uh, their boats in their kayaks and where we could all uh, have less congestion and more fun. Uh, so great writing can be ginormous $9 million grants for a foster care agency or it can be, you know, a $15,000 grant for uh, an organization that does an awful lot of good uh, like this one. Uh, just so you know, before we go to Q and A, um, I wrote a little book, and I mean little; it's not very big at all. Um, but it basically covers all the stuff I had it at the last conference. I was that one one of the little tables there, and uh, you can get it. Um, I can sell it to you for less on Square, or if you want an ebook, you can get it uh, there. Uh, if you're at all interested in reading this kind of stuff, I go into more detail with more anecdotes and more examples. And it could be good if you have some grant, stu uh, grant writing um, students who need to uh, learn some of the stuff we've talked about here today. And you would like for them to start working on proposals and, and developing their careers. This is pretty much what this is designed for. So that is that. And what I'd like to do is open things up for questions, uh, if anybody has any. Beth, are you there? I am. We haven't had anyone come through yet. Um, maybe while we're waiting for folks to, if they're typing things out, um, the what we talked about today is very much focused on writing a grant for an organization, someplace where we're working. How does it differ when folks are writing grants for their projects that are their own? If it's a book project or their dissertation, what what changes? What would what are some of the differences? Uh, the are you thinking government grants? Um, government grants. I mean, pretty much anything. If you have insights on any of it, mm -hmm. typically um, the uh, when someone is writing for their themselves or their own projects, those are. There's a quite a few opportunities for that within the NEH and the IMLS. And those, those are different in that um, you don't have to offer the organizational information beyond uh, the fact that you're in attendance and you will be in attendance and those things need to be verified. Uh, when it comes to, uh, but the, the the same things apply. You're basically responding. The, the funder is trying to determine whether or not you are equipped for the project that they're considering uh, funding. And so they will be asking you specific questions about your qualifications, the research you've done so far, what your plan for research might be, uh, who is supporting you, who is sustaining uh, 
who who is cooperating with you rather with what you're trying to determine and what you're trying to find out um, when it comes to funding for historical books uh, you would be proposing to a publisher uh, and as you know that's a bit of a long shot uh, I, I, and it, when it comes to searching, yes, there, it, for example, the foundation search link that I offered in the, uh, on the uh, web webinar, uh, you can do Boolean searches where they will, where you can click in and directly go to uh, funding writings, funding uh, internships, funding fellowships, and drill in to see who does that. Uh, and those could be some of the larger foundations who have specific interests. So if someone is, when it comes to searching, you would look for uh, organizations that you're already aware of within your sphere of interest, and you would determine who they're funding and why, and you'd try to determine whether or not they are interested in folks like yourself to do the same thing. Is my sound still cutting in and out? A little bit, but it's better than it was. Huh, it's interesting. Thank yeah. you for that, Laurie. So yeah. we, we've got a question um, and it is, do you have any suggestions for how to make an argument for impact for my own research? I am looking at research grants for a new book project, but the organization indicates that it prefers funding projects that will have an impact on the community or empowers women. I want to write something more sophisticated than quote, I research women. So uh, the, they are only going to fund that what they're interested in funding. Uh, there would be, uh, if they are explicitly saying that that is what they want to do, they're, I don't imagine that there would be a way to persuade them otherwise. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that you would need to find a different funder if you do not want to write about what they're asking for. It, it, I think that what they were asking was, it's in the funder's wheelhouse, but like, how do you make the best argument based on what they have, what's been published in, in the, the grant guidelines? Um, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'd need more specifics than that um, to be able to, to respond. Uh, go ahead and read the question. The question wants to do a second question and follow up. I'll ask it for us. Okay. Any more questions come through? Um, so while well, we have you, Lori, mm -hmm. um, um, and I know you kind of touched on this, but like if you had, you know, you did say with like take out very. Um, are there some other hard and fast rules that when you're putting together a grant application that you just say always do this? Sure. Yeah. Um, always um, determine who your who the team is you're going to be working with to to gather the information you need for a complete proposal so for example if i'm working in a in a mid-sized nonprofit organization i would generate first of all generate good relationships with all of the people that need to help you you know chocolate flowers whatever you need to do and then uh, I would have a meeting with them, quite frankly, 
Uh, for example, in the Jackson Foundation situation, I had a meeting with the, the um, head of the archive, had a meeting with the, um, our digitization specialist and the head of finance and the development director and I uh, all worked together in face-to-face -face meeting and we created a work plan. I gave them uh, what I, I gave the finance director the information I needed from them, uh, gave the digitization specialist the information I needed in order to explain how we were going to do the work plan. And I uh, spoke with, I gave specific questions to the museum director to help them. Uh, and they don't need to give me a, a beautiful narrative. I bullet, bullet pointed lists is all that I require in my case. And so the thing you must always do is determine who it is that's going to help you answer the questions on grant and collaborate with them as best you can uh, and give them uh, internal deadlines for what you need from them. A grant has an external deadline that can't be, you can't turn it in after that. So the internal deadlines need to come ahead uh, of that uh, within a, enough time that you can put everything together. So that would be an always do this thing. Okay, we have another question. Is it advisable to reach out and make a personal connection with someone in the grantor organization for clarification on grantor goals or terminology? Yes, it is. In fact, I always do. Uh, if, if they allow it. Now, some grantors will say, please do not contact. I honestly don't usually work with those grantors because they tend to be a re very reluctant crowd and they don't necessarily fit into uh, the kind of grantors that we've talked about today. Uh, but I, when I am not sure if this is, particularly when I'm not sure if something's a good fit, I always contact the grantor. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It's good to develop a relationship with the people who answer the phones and work the front desk and all that. And just like it is in every other human experience. And you are not, it's not unfair. You're not creating an advantage for yourself that other people can't also create. Uh, and also there have been times when I called a grantor and I said, I'm not sure if this is the right fit. And sure enough, what I thought was going to be a good fit was not. And they said, oh, no, no, we're, we're getting away from that now. And I couldn't have known that because they have a history of granting to the things I called about. And they said, what else are you doing? So I had to be ready with that spreadsheet we talked about where I have all these other programs. And I said, well, here's what's what's on the agenda for fundraising for me and I rattled off three or four different projects and they said ooh 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 and they liked the second one I talked about so calling them made it so that I didn't apply for the grant we wouldn't have gotten and we actually did get the one that they said was a better fit so I strongly encourage people to call funders even when you're dealing with the NEH and IMLS or any one of the uh, federal or state grantors. They have people on staff who respond to emails and respond to phone calls. And if you're not sure about something, ask, ask, ask. And it, it, it makes a big difference for you and for them because they don't, they get frustrated when they read something that isn't quite right. anybody have any additional questions? We have Lori for another 20 minutes if we want to want to have her so we can we can ask all sorts of questions if you'd like. One person is just ask is enthusiasm in your grant proposal helpful? Well, yeah that, that goes back to the to the uh, pathos bit. Um, when, when a voice is excited about something and believes in something, the enthusiasm can really come through. Uh, it, 
it can generate, you know, the kinds of responses that we're talking about. When you truly believe in something, it comes through. Uh, and if it doesn't come through, you don't have other readers read it. And if, if you're all, you think it's great and somebody else says, this is not great, then you can take another look at it. But generally though, um, enthusiasm can often be indicated with uh, your qualitative quotes. In other words, I, my emphasis is oral history. And so I engage a lot of quotes from people who've benefited from similar projects. And you can, you can offer through those quotes the enthusiasm, like the little uh, student who was saying, it's like playing at the museum. Uh, that, that gets a smile out of the reader. Uh, so, or quite frankly, if, if something is utterly unjust and needs to be addressed, uh, those kinds of, of qualitative quotes from people who will benefit from change are very much a way to create a certain enthusiasm. Um, and what you end up doing is you end up reflecting to your reader your enthusiasm by sharing with them what you're both hearing, what you're both reading from this person who'll benefit. And so it's a fine line when it comes to enthusiasm. You can be very excited about things, but you do not ever use an exclamation mark. And you uh, just make what you're telling them so compelling that they have to feel enthusiasm for what the outcome could be. And when, when the proof is in the pudding, the enthusiasm is there. Excellent, thank you, Lori. Another question. Would you contact a grantor and ask for a list of grants that they have awarded in the past? Uh, no, because I have access to that information. Um, and so does any other grant writer. It's asking them to do that legwork um, is a little bit like, I don't know, uh, asking them to do your work. Uh, that's, that's the work of, of the grant writer and the grant manager. Uh, the, the, it's tough to, to know where to look if you don't know where to look. But one of the ways that I determine, which because this is a really important thing to learn, uh, so it's a great question. What I do is, so let's, when I was working at a university, I went to, I did Google searches with the name of the foundation that we were thinking about applying to. And I, I looked for press releases for their grants. And sure enough, out pops, out pops a bunch of press releases where they're giving a grant to a hospital, they're giving a grant to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a children's services organization, it, not a single one went to a university. So I did my own research, started creating my own uh, knowledge of what different funders do and do not fund. Every now and then someone will fund outside of their typical routine and it's often because there's a foundation person on their board that went to a certain college and they'll do a uh, a grant in that direction sometimes. So you would research to see whether or not there's an alumni or something like that on their board. But the work of figuring out what someone funds is, is the work of the grant manager or the grant writer. Thank you. Um, another question. If an organization invites you to send a draft of your proposal prior to the application date deadline, is this a good idea? Recently, I was invited during a phone conversation to send my draft. I did this, but the person never responded. After a few weeks, I mailed, emailed that I was looking forward to her comments, but still never heard back from her. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the grant, and I wonder if sending the draft, which I did rewrite, rewrite was a bad idea. 
Uh, I've never heard of anyone doing that before. So this person who asked you to send a draft is an outlier. Uh, they aren't, um, that's typically not how it's done. So it could be that that person was stepping outside of protocol for their organization. And that ended up being a problem, probably for them and clearly for you. So um, I would just stay inside the grant guidelines for an organization. And if someone is an insider that uh, wants you to do something differently, I would be very cautious. Um, I, you know, I, I think if I were in that situation, I would probably, depending on the, the level of authority of the person who wanted this sent, uh, if it was someone who was very much a, a decision maker in the system, I would do it, but it would be really unorthodox. And it would, uh, uh, and then the fact that they did not get back to you at all shows a certain, um, it's difficult to know what that would mean, but I think it means that they were functioning outside the routine and uh, it might've been a problem for them. Very discouraging. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a rough situation. That's, that I've never had that happen to me. Now we have had, guidance meetings with with foundations where I've been involved in uh, discussions where they say, OK, this is the kind of stuff we're looking for. Here's what we want you to do. But never have they had me send a draft and then never get back to me. I've never experienced that. And that's uh, not a that's not a best practice. That's for sure. Definitely that it was a one off. Um, another question, how should I approach a personal statement section that is part of the grant application? What are some of the essential elements that I should include in this part of the application? So is this for a um, fellowship or a, what is this for a personal statement? The, it's not, they don't clarify that. It's just the personal statement section of the grant application. Okay, I would need to know what kind of grant it is. Maybe they can let you know. Okay, sounds good. Um, so if you wrote that question, please please do a follow-up question and I'll get it to Lori. And we got a little bit of clarification on the book project. I think I'm interpreting this correctly and I apologize if I'm not. Okay. So the, the project needs to be about women, but it's also how it can help promote women in academia. So not necessarily, she's not necessarily talking about the impact of the book project, but the, on whole, but it's about how it's gonna affect, I'm assuming her um, personally and how it will help her advance. The funding for this, getting her book project out will help her advance in academia and publishing. Oh. I see. I think. Yeah. And so the, the question then with that clarification, oh, that's the personal statement one? No, that was the grant that funds research for book projects that have oh. an impact. Okay. And so I see. Okay. So the, the person, I think, asking the question is wondering why that's relevant, right? And they're feeling perhaps like it's not about them. Um, but when it comes to how this would help promote someone personally, there's this, the obvious, uh, you know, it's good to be published thing. Um, and that this book project is in fact on target for their career goals and aspirations, uh, and just describing, uh, what they hope to accomplish throughout the remainder of their career and how this fits into that. Uh, I wouldn't delve into personal experiences that might feel emotional or compelling. I don't know that those sometimes that's necessary, but don't 
feel that that's what they're asking for. Um, that what they're wanting to know is, is where you're going with this and how it's gonna help you in your professional career. Uh, but I don't think you need to dig too deeply into the personal dynamics of that. Uh, it's mostly the professional trajectory of it all. I hope that helps. It's a, it's a little tough to answer that question. Thank you, Laurie. Okay, and we have clarification on the personal statement. Hmm. So it is for a research fellowship um, or grant. Okay. So personal uh, statement for a research fellowship, is there a way to get to know you and to understand what's important to you, uh, what your hopes are, what you plan to do with your career, who you hope to uh, help and influence, the kinds of people that you want to work with in the future, the kind of projects you would like to um, engage in, and, and why those things are important to you is, is very, uh, very important aspect of it. For, um, uh, one of my old professors used to say, so what? what why does this matter? Uh, wh what is moving you? What's motivating you? What is important here? Um, the personal statement, you would basically get a word picture of what you're about and what you're hoping to accomplish and why what you're doing matters. Uh, so I don't think it's a biography necessarily, unless there are certain life experiences that, that inform who you are. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you, Lori, for joining us from the Pacific Northwest, from the slopes of Mount Hood. To say I'm a little jealous about that. Um, <laughs> This webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the OAH YouTube channel sometime tomorrow afternoon or Friday morning. And you will receive an email with um, a link to the video as well as um, uh, links with the um, various resources that Lori mentioned during the webinar. And we have more professional development webinars uh, in the future and we we will be announcing them shortly. Thank you all.